This conference will now be recorded. Um, my research lab is a spatial ecology lab. We study microorganisms um, all the way to fish and sharks and try to understand where they're at and why they're there. Um, I was fortunate enough last year to get funding to um, study the use of Staphylococcus aureus and MRSA as a potential indicator of human pollution in Tampa Bay. Um, picture here of the original students who started on this project last year and my children who help us. Uh, so as you all know, we have a lot of amazing water areas here in Tampa Bay for recreational use. Uh, people use it you know, all the time with boats and fishing and lots of really fun, exciting things out on the water. Uh, but a lot of the work that I'm doing is just trying to put together some risk assessments and potentials of what, so people can know what's in the water. Um, right now, we currently is being monitored as things like enterococcus or E. coli or some of these rods. Um, there have been cases of like Vibrio vinificus and other things that have shown up in the water. But we also have Staphylococcus, which is right here, which is a gram positive bacteria that causes staph infections. You can um, also get a MRSA infection from this. We've had a couple students on our rowing team here at UT actually get a staph infection from um, being in the river here. Um, so the Florida Healthy Beaches program, I'm sure you guys are all well aware, um, mostly isolates enterococcus from different areas around the water body which is primarily found in feces. It is found in humans, animals, all lots of things. And so we don't always have the best way of saying where these have come from. So there are really good tools like source tracking and those types of things that we can do. But again, a lot of that enterococcus can be in there from animals. Um, one of the big projects I worked on when I used to be in Texas, we found it was mostly birds causing a lot of the water bodies to be on, on the um, bad list, you could say. And so when I came here to Florida, I was really interested in trying to do this with the bacterium that is mostly found on humans. And so most of it, it does enter through discharge and things like that, but it's mostly found on our bodies. Um, so a lot of um, bacteria that's getting into the river, into our bays is from discharge, legal and illegal, uh, waves, storms, sediment, suspension. So you, again, it, with like the Florida Healthy Beaches program, they're gonna find a lot higher enterococcus in the water after sediment suspension or after storms. Um, when we went out sampling on Monday, it was rainy or Friday, it was raining. The waves were pretty, actually waves in Tampa Bay. I felt like you could probably surf out there we got a lot more bacteria when you have areas like that. Um, one of, uh, this is a great paper that was done actually in California that was looking at how much staph was there compared to enterococcus. And they found that it followed the same patterns of entero. So when numbers were high of enterococcus, so was staph, as well as MRSA in all of the areas that they sampled. Um, it wasn't as high, but 59% of the samples still had staph, or 79 had entero. It was found in the water and in the sediment. Um, this was one of the papers that got me started studying staph here in Tampa. So I started on the Hillsborough River about seven years ago and now have migrated out to the bay. So again, why study staph? Well, the main reason is it's a human indicator. It, mostly found on humans. It can live on some like dog skins and stuff like that, but it's primarily on humans. It's part of our normal fauna. So most people carry Staphylococcus aureus on them. It is an opportunistic pathogen. So most of the time you're okay, but if you get a cut or something like that and you are a carrier of it, you can get a staph infection. Um, it really likes to reside in your nose, um, but it is pathogenic. It lyses blood cells and causes um, uh, some severe infections if you are exposed to too much of this and can't fight it off. So here's some lovely pictures uh, showing staph infections. Um, you know, most of the time they can be treated with ointments or with antibiotics, but we do have MRSA, um, which we have been, we've been finding in the water. I'll, I'll show that to you here in a little bit. 
So this is a staph infection that's resistant to your psyllins. So something like penicillin, amoxicillin, oxacillin, um, and that's usually the first line of defense that we use to treat some kind of a staph infection. Some of the MRSA isolates um, we're finding now in the hospital setting are also resistant to like vancomycin, which is the next line of defense. So it is a problem, especially if you get it, um, get a staph infection that's resistant to the antibiotics that we're used to using. So the kind of the main goals that we're doing here in Tampa Bay is, you know, these public bodies of water have a really high risk of being a reservoir for transmission of staph. Staph is a bacterium species that thrives in warm waters, which again is Tampa Bay. It also really prefers high salinity. And so because it resides on your skin, it's very used to high salinities. And so the, you know, in the summertime when the water is really warm and our salinity is really high, that's prime location for that. And so by being able to examine and get an idea of how much stuff is in our water, we could potentially reduce human exposure to the contaminant, assist in cleaning up local water bodies, um, implement a preventative initiative statewide, and then treat the patients more effectively if we have an understanding of what kind of antibiotics and what treatment and even what strains of staff are in the water. So really quickly, some of the projects that I've done with this. So we looked at Staphylococcus in the Hillsborough River from pretty much University of Tampa down to Tampa General Hospital, found an obscene amount, unfortunately, of staph there and MRSA in the water. I've been able to isolate it on oysters within the Hillsborough River. So oysters seem to be a, a prime reservoir for staph on the outside as well as inside on their gills. Um, we have isolated several MRSA strains from the inside of fish, fish's mouth. So we mostly focused on sheep's head because they have those big giant teeth and people like to, um, you know, get the fish hook out and sometimes get bit by them. And so I wanted to see if there was MRSA isolates in their mouth and there is. Um, we have looked at environmental stressors on staff to see what's causing them to form a biofilm. So a lot of times, um, the bacteria, when they're stressed out, they'll form a biofilm, which makes them really strong and extremely difficult to kill. So we've been able to kind of figure out what thrives for them to get into this kind of mode. It's almost like making them a multicellular organism and very hard for us to handle. And they really, they like high salinity, high temperature, and they'll, they'll do this for us. Also on a small scale, we studied um, before this grant got started, isolating staff from Redneck Riviera or Gandy Beach, whatever you wanna call it, and comparing those values to Whedon Island. So um, if you've been to Redneck Riviera, it's a really beautiful place. You can drive right up on the water. Um, and so a lot of extremely high recreational use, whereas Whedon Island is mostly used for kayaking and paddle boarding. So a lot less human exposure as far as being in the water is there. And we did find in that study substantially more, significantly more staff on, in Gandhi than we did on Whedon Island. But this project was to expand that out and we've tried to hit some key locations all the way around Tampa Bay. So our specific objectives was it, right now that we're working on is to assess the viability of staff as an indicator of human pollution in high and low human use areas in Tampa Bay. And so how we've set this up for recreational high and recreational low uses is we go to these seven sites. So we go to Redneck, uh, Riviera, Picnic Island, Ben Davis, Cypress Point, Davis Island, E.G. Simmons, and Bahia Beach. We do all of that in one morning. So we go out on a Friday. We leave on about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning to get to all these sites before uh, EPA standards tell me I can't be out there anymore. Friday's um, samples are processed and then we go the following Monday and we're using Friday as like low recreational usage, mostly because most people use the waters for recreational use over the weekend. And then we go Monday to see if the numbers are higher on Monday. From there, we quantify the spatial temporal distribution of staff and as MRSA. And then at the end of this project, we will be 
putting together a um, risk of exposure to staff and MRSA in Tampa Bay. So the methods that my, these are my students out collecting here. We go out and we collect early in the morning using sterile water bottles and try to go out as, as far as where we think the people are swimming. Um, they open up and get water in those bottles underneath the water so that there's no air contamination. The uh, water's put on ice, brought back to the lab and filtered within two hours of collection. Um, it's filtered onto filter paper that has small little pores in it that are 0.45 micrometers so that the bacteria stays on top of those filter papers. We then put those filter papers on mannitol salt auger, which is a media that selects for staph, the genus staph, and then differentiates between the different species. And then from there, we count um, colony forming units per milliliters of water. So anything on mannitol salt auger is supposed to be <laughs> staph aureus or yellow colonies due to the pH change um, because they use mannitol. However, um, it is, and I know that um, mannitol salt auger can have some false positives on here. So we do do some biochemical testing to test for this. So anything that we count all of the yellow isolates, nothing that's pink. From there, we pick random colonies from each plate to do what's called a coagulase test on them. And then if they're positive for a coagulase, that's a sign that it is Staph aureus. All of them that test positive on coagulase, this is what that would look like, this clumping, then go on to blood auger to see if they're lysing the blood cells, which is another biochemical indicator that it's Staph. And then all of those that pass there go into PCR testing for molecular confirmation that that's what we're using, what we actually isolated. And then any of them, whatever our positivity rate then goes back to correct any of the counts that we have. For identification of MRSA, it first starts with what's called a Kirby-Bauer method. And so we grow the bacteria on a plate and then add an oxacillin disc to it if the, we measure this zone of inhibition and then anything that shows up resistant, we label as MRSA and then that is further confirmed through genetic analysis. Um, so we're using PCR, Dr. Osevich here is doing this component of the project. Um, and so we've at first had a kind of a hard time isolating it on their end um, confirming that this was actually staff, but the biggest issue was the primers that were being used were more medical type primers and we're getting environmental samples. So as soon as we switched the primers, we've been getting about an 80 to 85% positivity rate on the molecular end of things. Um, and so she's, this is the parameter she's running them all at, and this is the gel that it looks like for confirmation. Some of the ones that have come up in the lab, positive for me and negative for her, we are sending out to get DNA sequencing to try to figure out what those actually are, the few that have not, who have passed half the test and not the other half. Okay, um, I just mentioned that. So here are some of the results that we have. Again, the, the study is still going. We're collecting monthly through the end of September. And so this is just preliminary. Um, data. So the red bars are the mean amount of staff on a Friday versus a Monday. We really thought going into this, we'd find a lot more bacteria on Monday than Friday, but that's not always holding true. I, I do think some of this is because it seems like it rains every month on the Friday, like the day before we go out on a Friday and rain, I think is overpowering that. And so the next set of analysis I have students working on right now is to analyze this compared to wet and dry events. And we didn't purposely set those up. It's just, we can only go out when I have a whole team to go and do this. Um, but we are finding staff at all of the locations. Davis Island tends to have less, but they are there. Um, it is there at all of them. And the day thing isn't necessarily working out, but I think when we tease apart the weather, that will make more sense. 
So here's just kind of the box plot of what we're looking at between the days. There's not significant between Friday or Monday. Here is a box plot by site. And so Picnic Island, as of now, is showing the highest mean of staff. Davis Island and E.G. Simmons are the lowest ones, but it is pretty consistent across the site. So we did do a two-way NOVA on these and day and site is not pulling up significant. And what that tells me, again, is that it, there's a consistent amount of staff in the water. And we are finding, I did rank transform this data um, if you've ever worked with bacteria, it gets a little bit complicated. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out what dilutions to do, and then something happens, and we end up with plates that are too numerous to count. And I, in my opinion, those are the most important plates. And so I rank these in order to get uh, those too numerous to count values in there. But the staff, it is there, it's in the water, and it's consistent across the locations. Um, here is some pie charts of the Kirby Bauer results, so the isolates that are MRSA. So anything that's red is the portion of MRSA. Um, and so at each of the sites, regardless if it's Friday or Monday, we have found MRSA isolates at all of them. Um, Bahia Beach has had the lowest number, but we have found them at all locations. So kind of, you know, PCR and the gel electrophoresis has confirmed about 80% of our samples, which I'm pretty happy with being that we're using Manitou salt auger. Friday has tended to have um, greater amount of staff there, but again, I really think that's due to the rain <laughs> that we've been getting a lot of. Um, there is a consistent amount of staff in the water we are. We did miss a couple months, unfortunately, in the summertime because of COVID, uh, when the beaches were closed. Um, I, I don't know if I could have got permission or not, but what I did not have permission to was to be at UT. And so we weren't able to sample what, April and May, maybe it was last year, and those are kind of prime months. So I'm really excited to get those samples this month, this, this summer. Once the data the monthly data is finished being collected. It will be sent to one of my colleagues here, um, Tracy Zontek, who will be putting together a risk assessment framework. Um, this is kind of out of my wheelhouse. This is her area of specialty. So I'll just kind of zoom into some of these slides um, where she put together for me to, to kind of tell you what she's going to do. So we're going to calculate the concentration using pathogen dis density, published kind of densities on those and then estimate the dose by route of exposure. And then from there, she'll be able to predict the probability of illness for all of these locations. Um, and so the kind of framework or the risk characterization is to evaluate risk to human health, assess any uncertainties that there might be in the data, characterize this risk based on route of exposure, and then reconsider any conceptual model for emerging pathways based off of the results that we find. Um, from there, then we can develop materials to frame the risk for technical experts and the general population. And so based off of these, there'll be a technical report sent to you guys as well as public kind of friendly documentation if you would like to share that or if you would like for us to share that, however that would need to be administered, that will be kind of the final outcome that comes from this. Um, this has been an amazing experience for the students here at UT. We are an undergraduate facility. Um, all of these students listed here have participated in this project. I usually have a group of about 10 students here each day that is working on this. We have um, presented seven different poster presentations. Two oral presentations were given at the Florida Academy of Sciences last week. Um, and it's, it's just been a really, really amazing experience for all of these students. So they've become a family because of this grant. So I can't thank you guys enough. Half of them now live together, which is pretty awesome. And my children get to come and participate. And I think that there's nothing more important than getting little kids involved in science and understanding what's going on out there. Um, and then I, my collaborators, Dr. Osovich and Dr. Zontek are a big part of this. 
And then the big, very small study was funded from Tampa, uh, from UT. And then I'd like to thank the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund for funding this part of the project. And with that, I'll take any questions. Awesome, thank you. You're Does welcome. anyone have any questions? I don't see any in the chat yet. Um, can I ask a question? This is Jody Harwood. Absolutely. Sure. Um, so what percentage then of, uh, the, you showed the pie charts really quickly of the environmental samples, but what percentage of the Staph aureus that you're finding are MRSA? About 20. So does that concern you? Um, because that would be, I've never seen anything remotely like that in an environmental study, that high, of, that high a percentage. And then one would think that people would be getting a lot of MRSA infections from exposure to water, if that were true. Yes, and so again, um, this is preliminary analysis. So this is what's showing up on the Kirby Bauer end of things. And then we are not done confirming 100% what it is on the genetic side. So that number could go up, it could go down depending on what's pulling out molecular wise. How would it go up? Well, because I give her all of my samples, so every single sample is tested, and so um, we we do it on our end. All of the DNA from every single isolate isolate we test, whether it's MRSA or not, gets sent to the genetic end, and then that's being tested for the MECA gene to determine if it's staph or not. So, if we have any isolates that show to be susceptible in the lab but have a MEC aging that would change that number and vice versa the other way that's why we're doing the molecular side i'm a little confused that from the, from from the pie, pie charts that you showed what percent of those isolates have been confirmed either with MEC a or with the nuke staph aureus genes i assume it's the nuke that you're using for to confirm staph aureus i do not have that data from dr osovich yet I would just on the genetic so side. I have the months that she has done on the just confirming staff is about 80% um, positivity rate she's been getting on that end that we've been sending her, but I do not have the MRSA percentages yet. Yeah, I mean, I I, I would just we 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 just finished a study a study in wastewater and you know that these so the you know the manitol salt auger was was developed to work in the medical realm so your so the the pool of potential false positive organisms that you have in those kind of samples are much smaller than what you have in the environment and so i would just I would just caution against showing preliminary results because it's it can be really alarming so if you think Oh my God! Twenty percent of these staph aureus are are MRSA. Um, again, that's something that is completely unprecedented, and something that you know we've been screening wastewater, and we would never see anything like that. So sure. I was uh, asked specifically to present to you guys my preliminary analysis. So this is what I'm doing. Okay. Yeah, I would. Yeah, just definitely emphasize that it's super prelim because that's I, I've just never seen anything like that. So. The project isn't done till September, October. I was asked specifically to present to you what I have so far, and this is what we have so far. And I, I do feel like I made it very clear this is preliminary work that we're doing and the genetic end of things is not done yet. And just one more quick question. You said the original primers that were used, I think to confirm Staph aureus were two. They, they weren't coming up, but it was showing up staff. We did switch our primer to an environmental specific primer that actually was used in the paper that I cited. And then everything, it, it worked beautifully. So that was in the Goodwin et al. paper? Yes. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I know I'm very interested to see how the the risk assessment framework comes out, um, and I think you know, as as Jody was kind of alluding to, it'll be really important to make sure that we communicate the actual risk, um, you know, to to the public um, appropriately. I think 
a lot of times, you know, like when you see like flesh eating bacteria, you know, it's like this worst case scenario kind of thing. And so to help people more appropriately situate that risk, I think will be really useful, a useful product from this work. Okay. We've got several um, thanks for your great presentation and interesting, interesting work. And everybody's looking forward to seeing your final results. Okay. All right. And about October, I think, is when our deadline is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I do have to go teach, so good luck to everybody else today and enjoy your meeting. All right, our next um, presenter today is Steve Lang. Good, good morning. Um, as, as Maya said, I'm Steve Lang with the Coast Guard at Sector St. Petersburg. And uh, good morning to everyone. And thank you for the invitation to speak with uh, the group today. Um, the project that I'm working on is uh, the Area Contingency Plan. And it is a, a plan that was federally mandated as a result of the Exxon Valdez oil spill back in 1990, 89-ish, uh, and out of the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. So the, the old plan, the Area Contingency Plan, um, the Coast Guard sent out a a survey back in 2016 because through the various area committee meetings and other uh, NOAA and EPA and other Coast Guard members, they were getting a feel that the area contingency plan was uh, a little dated. So they sent out a survey to ask various questions about is the plan meeting your expectations for local, federal, and state agencies. And um, as a result, they put together a working group um, in 2019. And there were numerous uh, federal agencies that are involved in environmental uh, law enforcement, which includes the Coast Guard, EPA, NOAA, uh, Department of Interior, Department of Energy, and so on. And with that, they uh, they had they reviewed the results and um, came up with some interesting um, ideas how to move forward and how to change the area contingency plan. And most of it was um, they wanted to get the plan to be used and not just be uh, sitting on the bookshelf and only come out when um, an oil spill or something bad happens. So they wanted to get people to use it more on a daily basis to basically make it more operationally focused. So um, that is what the EPA, uh, excuse me, Yes, that the Coast Guard is the chair of this, and the EPA would be the co-chair. So they came up with a um, a template, if you will. Now this template has changed over the past two years since they started telling uh, the Coast Guard sectors around the nation to update their plan. Um, so they came up with an idea to basically, like I've mentioned before, um, operationally focus the plan. And in doing so, uh, they came up with a vol volume one, which is the base plan, and which ours right now is a little less than 90 pages. And that might not seem a lot, but when the original plan was drafted in the early 90s, it was five, six, seven hundred pages, depending on which sector within the Coast Guard you're talking to. Now, our sector here in the West Central Florida covers from Jefferson County 
to our north in the Panhandle area, all the way down to the border of Collier and Monroe County. So that's that's basically the entire west coast of Florida. Um, as compared to Sector Key West, which has Monroe County, Sector Miami, which is from Brevard down, and Sector Jacksonville is from northern Brevard up to the Georgia border. And then you have Sector Mobile to our west, which covers the other part of the Panhandle going out towards Alabama. So that's kind of like all the sectors that you ha we have to deal with. And um, in that, it's volume one is it's very similar in the format as the original area contingency plan. You have the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, and so on series. Um, and I won't, you can see them on your, your screen, so I'll go into what each one of those mean. But um, as of right now, there have only been two plans that have um, been approved by the, which it says CGNRP, that's the Coast Guard National Review Panel. Um, and those two plans would be Sector San Juan and Sector Southwest Texas. Southwest Texas covers, as it is Southwest Texas, as well as south or i'm sorry southeast texas as well as southwest louisiana so that's their area so ours is due to um our district office in miami come at least or no later than one may um and the process is we we get together we develop the plan of which we're using the the texas area contingency plan as of as a template and um, we make it our own we we make it uh, we make it usable and operationally focused for our local local users um, we put that together we send it to district miami the admiral there says okay it meets the definition of our new 2021 uh, area contingency plan format he um, approves the plan. We, in turn, here locally, would draft a letter of promulgation of which it would go to the local committees and our local area committee and our local environmental responders um, saying, okay, here's the plan. The captain of the port has, or the sector commander has promulgated it, and then it goes up to, to headquarters, to Washington, D.C., and then it gets for final approval with the national uh, review level. So there's volume, um, I'm kind of um, getting into the weeds there. Um, volume two, I talked about volume one. Now volume two is um, mostly links. And that's most of the uh, important thing for the, to make it operationally is you go to volume two and if you want to find out something specific on an issue, you can go to the link and it links you to whatever organization or agency that owns that particular nugget of information. So it makes it more up to date. It makes it easier to use and it gives you the um, um, it eliminates the redundancy of having new information and old information from a plan that's been sitting on the wall. So that's the the beauty of volume two is it's mostly links and you can click on and find pretty much a, any information you want. As of right now, there's 198, almost 200 individual links. And that's coming from the Coast Guard, from the EPA to the state of Florida to uh, there's a link there for the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, anything you want. It's pretty pretty extensive okay now if you want to find where what our plan is you can type in any Google search uh, homeport.uscg.mil or you can Google US Coast Guard homeport sector st. Petersburg and it will come up with um, the information you're looking for and 
so here's I'm just going to walk you through if you are interested in seeing what we have and follow these these next steps so if you go to homeport coastguard.mil um, you scroll over the port directory and next slide type in home port like that then that's the screen you would use to say okay so highlighted in the upper left is the port directory if you click on that you scroll down to next to sector st. Petersburg and this is the slide you will come up with and in the bottom right hand corner is where the under contingency plans is the 2021 area contingency plan and that's the information you have there and it's called the 2021 West Central Florida area contingency plan and as you can see um, on the right there's all the attachments now this has been updated I updated some of it yesterday based on information I got from Florida DEP and Florida Wildlife Research Institute some partners there recommended some changes so I added some attachments but essentially that's what you look you're looking at you're looking at 29 appendices volume 1 volume 2 and another thing that's important there's a item there towards the bottom called crosswalk so if you're familiar with the old ACP area contingency plan format you can find out what where it is in the old plan and compare it to where it would be uh, located in the new 2021 plan and um, like I mentioned before um, our submission to the Coast Guard National Review panel is in May and the idea is that um, the next review would be 2025 so it's a four-year cycle and within that four-year cycle the Coast Guard is mandated to conduct um, various types of exercises, oil spill exercises, whether it be a response to a real world event, would be a tabletop, full scale, functional, or a workshop, or, or what would be appropriate given the, um, the flavor of what the port community would want to do, i.e., we had a port manatee wanted to do a train derailment exercise in conjunction with West Manatee Fire and Rescue. So they put together a, a um, tabletop exercise that was a chemical rail car overturned outside of Port Manatee, which threatened to uh, impact Tampa Bay. So the Coast Guard got involved in that, and then we were uh, just participated in the exercise, but we would we still got credit for the exercise. So um, the I'm giving this out now because uh, as you could see, the challenges that we're having is everyone's busy, everyone has normal operations, and within the Coast Guard or within the military itself and a lot of companies you have people rotate in and out um, for us here locally it's every three years for the for the active duty military um, I'm a civilian I'm retired Coast Guard so uh, hopefully I won't be going any anywhere anytime soon um, and lack of funding and I'll end it with with the lack of funding for the most part because that um, the good graces of the old plan we had um, Fish and Wildlife Research Institute uh, they have our old plan in a GIS format on their server and but it's a little dated in the fact that you have environmentally sensitive index maps you have uh, geographic response plans and strategies you have all that stuff that's on their server so it's if you click on it you have ArcGIS and you there's a ton of information um, on anything from staging areas to to what kind of environmental um, impacts there would be based on the chemical or the type of oil 
product spilled to booming strategies to a, a, a slew of different stuff. But unfortunately, um, there's no funding in our current budget to update that information. Um, hopefully, we're working with our district partners and uh, Mr. Tim and Rice with uh, with the state uh, Florida Wildlife Research Institute. So hopefully we can get some funding together and we can update that. And the last time that was updated was 2011, immediately after the Deepwater Horizon incident that we went through the whole west coast of Florida and we updated all of our geographic response strategies. It's dated, but hopefully not too many things have changed over the years. Um, um, that, that would still be viable asset if uh, we would have a spill today. Um, with that, um, our plan now is to, um, I'm going to up, be updating the plan uh, based on uh, people's recommendations and and uh, get it to district prior to 1 May. And that doesn't um, preclude us from ever changing it again. But once it's approved, we'll do annual updates and uh, continual continuous improvement for the plan. Um, and I, I think you'll like the plan. It's a lot easier to use than the old one. So, uh, and keep in mind, this is not just the Coast Guard or EPA plan, it's just our local plan. That's what we will be using if there is an oil spill, a, a response. And of course the Coast Guard wouldn't be able to do um, our job without your assistance. So. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll open up for any questions. Thanks, Steve. I just want to put a little context for everyone. Um, you know, this is an action in our CCMP is to support uh, better coordination between the spill response community and the environmental community. So that's part of why I invited him to present here today. Um, and it sounds like there are some, some potential needs in terms of updating and making sure we have the best available information um, to protect those natural resources that we're all working hard to understand and restore. Um, so I just wanna offer that. And in the CCMP, we talk about booming strategies and different things like that, how we could partner there. So um, if, if some of you are a little confused about why I asked um, Steve to present, I wanna put that out there. But I also had a, a question for you, Steve. Um, we've recently worked to put together a standard operating procedure for red tide response, um, mm -hmm. and we'd like to work with all of our partner um, communities to have sort of a standardized approach to how to how to deal with red tide uh, should it come upon our shores. And I'm wondering if you think that's something that might make sense to include in this plan, or at least share share there with other with other responders. Um. Red, red tide red red tide is one of those the area contingency plan is uh has has this material i mean chemicals or oil spill of some sort type of response plan um i'm not really familiar with red tide but it's more of a it could be considered more of a natural or caused by man-made with fertilizers or whatever from what i understand um we would mainly get involved in red tide response if it uh, impacts a navigable waterway. For instance, we were approached by city of either Madeira Beach or Treasure Island, or maybe it was the county, in order to put some sort of barrier across John's Pass to keep the fish from coming in. And... Um, we, we got involved in that because we didn't want to block the channel as vessels can come and go through the channel of John's Pass. We'll fully support it. I mean, it's it's very nasty when all the fish comes in. in and then it comes into the point of the marine debris as the fish get into the canals and stuff. So um, I can certainly have a link on in Volume 2 to what you know, some more additional red tide information. And certainly we, we can discuss it within the area committee to see it's a viable a viable thing to include. Um, I'm not opposed to any of that. I'm just not really familiar with how the red tide would impact a chemical or oil spill response. Well, I think, I think you kind of 
made the connection in your in your own in your own head it's mostly dealing with the the, the fish after the fact um and and some of the the strategies that i think some of the local governments are pursuing to try and um recover recover the fish before they sort of sink to the the bottom and create additional problems so um so some of that expertise that that lives within the emergency response community i think could be beneficial in the environmental community um, i'll certainly share uh, with you the the link to the sop that we put together and i don't know if kelly can weigh in on how the the fish and debris is um, classified for um for landfills if that helps at all um it's a it's a it's a class i think it's called a class two biological debris so we actually had to amend our contracts um for the management of it but it, it can be disposed of um, at a landfill. It's it's not a big deal. And actually, I was the one who submitted that plan for closing off John's Pass. So it's very oh. familiar. With that. <laughs> so um, <laughs> yeah, that was great. Uh, kind of on the fly, um, but it, it would it would be good for us. Um, I mean, maybe uh, not so much on your operations, but it would be good for us to know how to um, submit those plans and things like that and have that better in our SOP because we were kind of just, um, we didn't really have an SOP. We really, I mean, we knew what we wanted to do, but we really didn't know the information that you needed in order to make it happen. So um, I think on our end, it would be helpful to have that information up front that way when, when we need to submit a plan to the, um, you know, to the Coast Guard for consideration of a booming activity or something like that, that we can do a better job from the get-go instead of having to ask so many questions. Certainly, certainly. And that and we can help in waterways management um, to protect the um, the people responding to cleaning it up so the local boaters aren't um, in the way as people tend to be. Uh, along those lines and, and talking about booming, I know in 2011 there's a concern of what our current inventory of booming uh available boom was and i was wondering is this plan is that still a gap in this plan in terms of the overall inventory available that's viable in the tampa bay region for a large-scale response um that's a that's a good question there's um like i don't think there's enough boom in the world to satisfy everyone i mean people were coming up with hair boom and feather booms and different ideas um but I don't, in 2011, I don't, it was a big concern. And at that time, everyone was mobilized just to get right. everything out of storage to see if it was dry rotted or not. <laughs> yep. Yep. But, and that's the thing you have. I mean, people in today's um, envi uh, environment, in today's financial um, status is they're not willing to or it's not viable to keep thousands and thousands of feet of boom on hand uh, just in case. But there are companies that get paid very well to do that. It's just not, uh, you have to be very smart with what we have. And I think we've we've come to recognize um, that there isn't enough boom for everything, but you have to be inventive in your ways of using it more effectively by deflective boom or protection boom. or And that's why in our plan we have uh, the you protect the highest environmentally sensitive areas first, and then you, you move from there um, in different response strategies as well. So to answer your question, I, I don't know if it will ever not be a gap, um, but I think we're we're better suited mentally in, in, in our training and in our lessons learned from the past to, to, to make it make it less of an impact to the environment um, if, if you have boom. And like for Deepwater Horizon, that impacted, impacted many states. So everybody was responding from all over the nation and all over the world for that matter. But if it's more of a, um, a Tampa Bay focus spill, and hopefully I'm knocking on wood here that that won't happen. Um, if it, it's a smaller spill, I think we have enough boom and enough strategies and response equipment 
in this area as well as maybe in the southeast that we could re respond adequately. Does that answer? Yeah, I appreciate the response. I was just curious if, you know, having a listing or an inventory, an updated inventory of viable boom for the region, uh, and, if that's still a need for this update or not. Uh, there, there is a there's a Coast Guard um, team at the National Pollution uh, or at the National Strike Force Coordination Center that goes out. And if you're an oil spill response organization that has a contract with the Coast Guard to respond in any given fashion, we go out, we meaning that Coast Guard team goes out and inventories your, um, your equipment to make sure you have what you say you have. And um, so there is an, an up-to-date list uh, available. Great, thank you. You're welcome. And Gary Rollerson asked if this information has been shared with the Harbor Safety and Security Committee. Um, not this particular presentation, um, but it is with the Area Committee, and I'm not sure when the next Harbor Safety and Security Committee meeting is, but I can certainly make that available, yes. Great, it's thank all you handled in our same office it's just another gentleman across the hallway that does it so that's that's not a big deal yep is there anything that you would appreciate hearing from us a way we can help you have a better plan um not necessarily um i, I wasn't planning on that question that's a good one um no, just support. <laughs> I, 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 you got me on that one, Maya. Okay. Well, I wasn't trying to get you. No, um, I know. Like uh, I it just or... it it's when it, it just comes down to funding, and it it's super frustrating. That's all I have to say. And it's not due to lack of concern on the local Coast Guard's part. It's just a much bigger problem, and um, we do what we can. And I'll I'll just leave it at that. So the so there's a funding need for some of the environmental inventories that are that are out there to update some of that geographic information. C correct, and to have the um, um, Fish and Wildlife Research Institute to maintain that particular GIS format. Mm -hmm. Okay. Seems well, like there might be good opportunity to leverage resources that actually program to support that update. Yeah, it's true. And um, the my counterparts in Miami at the district office, as well as in land area, we, we all recognize that that, that it's a, a concern and um, it's not meant to be this fiscal year, I'll put it that way. But it's not to say it won't happen. Yeah, let's let's uh, stay in communication about ways we can um, help support to make sure that that is adequately funded and, and in there uh, with the best available information. All right. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sure. All right. Our next presenter is um, Megan Long from Wood plc and she's going to talk to us about some projects that they've been working on for urban stream enhancement okay i'm unmuted are you guys seeing my screen yes okay all right so um again i'm megan long with wood and um just want to mention some of the other key players in our florida stream team who helped me put some of this together, um, John Kiefer, Mary Sobranek, and Kristen Nowak. Um, so I'll be presenting on utilizing stream restoration concepts to improve water quality, habitat, and resilience. My controls aren't working. There we go. Okay. Um, so just a brief outline. Um, first, I'll go into an introduction of our wood stream design team. Um, then I'll get into urban channels and streams and go through our stream restoration approach with an example project. Um, then get into a little bit of our designing for resilience and the many benefits of stream restoration. 
So first, a very brief introduction to our wood stream design team. Um, specifically in Florida, we have a very diverse staff of you know, fluvial geomorphologists, scientists, engineers with lots of lots and lots of years of experience, specifically in Florida and in other states. Um, and we find that the depth and breadth of our team helps us cover all our bases. And from the very first phases, we can plan for design and construction and maintenance. Um, we also have diverse project experience. We've worked with many different counties and municipalities, water management districts, public agencies, and um, even pri private clients in urban and rural dif um, different areas, wild and scenic rivers, disturbed areas all throughout the state of Florida. And just to note, we also are developing a national stream team, so we'll be expanding our services throughout uh, the US. So our basic ideology when we approach stream restoration is first and foremost to fit the designs to Florida specific or regionally specific design criteria. Um, our team has studied and characterized Florida streams extensively. And by designing for regional criteria, that means our designs are gonna hold up to Florida weather, Florida conditions, and be able to maintain themselves as natural Florida streams. Um, the other thing we like to do is to design for maximum benefit. So if our main project goal is something like erosion control or flood protection, we can use stream restoration as a tool to be able to fit all these other different things into those designs whether that's you know, recreation and improved habitat or reduced maintenance, economic opportunities, um, things like that. So essentially we like to turn something that's just a conveyance into more of a commodity or a communal space if we can. So now I'm gonna jump into um, specifically urban channels and streams. So in these often channelized urban streams, we see something that we like to call urban stream syndrome. And with this, it's characterized by largely impervious watersheds with flashy hydrographs, so lots of rainfall and runoff in a short period of time. And these high velocities and flows can cause scour, erosion, and then transport of that sediment downstream. This often leads to a loss of floodplain function, um, increased flooding, reduced habitat and biodiversity. Um, we see a lot of bank failures, property loss, those high operation and maintenance costs and repairs, and um, some water quality impacts. So here is sort of a, a typical snapshot of those um, very incised urban channels that we see. Um, and here you can see maybe there was a very little vegetation or you know mown grass and there's scouring at the toe and bank failures and erosion. And this material that's carved out of here ends up usually downstream um, plugging up a bridge culvert. And that can lead to a lot of flooding problems. So I'll go through our typical stream restoration approach using a specific example. I don't know why that happened. Um, so Joe's Creek in Pinellas County um, is the project I'll be going through, but we do have lots of other streams that we're working on. Um, McCoy's Creek in Jacksonville, Alligator Creek in Sarasota County, Carpenter Creek in Pensacola, um, and many, many others. Um, and oftentimes with these urban stream projects, what we're seeing are sort of two common things. Um, one, a lot of these urban cores that we're working in are near a coast, so we have to use you know, tidal considerations and um, address sea level rise. Um, and the second big thing is that these projects usually have one or two primary concerns that need to be addressed, um, whether or not stream restoration is possible. So in the case of Joe's Creek, as you can see here, erosion, um, erosion control and bank stabilization were the primary goal of this project. So in a bank stabilization project, you have a couple different options and we assessed and compared three different options. Um, first is hard armoring, which is, you know, riprap, gabion baskets, um, the traditional gray engineering approach. Um, this stabilizes the banks, but it has, you know, very few other benefits. You can go with a more blended approach, which is, you know, cutting back the banks, foresting them. And this offers some aesthetic and habitat benefits. Um, but ultimately the gold standard is stream restoration. 
Um, you can address bank stability issues, but it also offers a host of other ecological and social benefits. So for stream restoration in an urban setting, ultimately the goal is to fit a natural uh, multi-stage stream channel into the existing footprint of the channel. Um, and so when you're doing this, you're creating and reconnecting floodplains, which um, gives you riparian habitat. It really slows down the flow and reduces those shear stresses, and you get a treatment and recharge in the wetlands. Um, you also are adding these you know, natural, natural things like meanders and pools and riffles, and those can act as sediment sumps, create aquatic habitat, and um, offer more water quality benefits. So while stream restoration might be, you know, your gold standard option, um, you have to do an analysis to make sure that you actually can fit stream restoration into your site conditions. So the first step is to break up your stream into functional process zones, which are modular portions of your stream that share characteristics like flow, channel, shape and size, habitat, adjacent land use, you know, how much right of way and the opportunities that you have in each area. Um, so you can assess and then address each one of these individually. And um, this also helps with design and construction phasing later. So once you've broken everything out into your functional process zones, you need to see if there's gonna be enough power in each of those to maintain a natural stream. Um, so our team, Dr. Kiefer, Kristen Nowak, um, they developed empirical equations based on a comprehensive survey of Florida streams. And so you can look at your site conditions and if they fall within this range, you know that it will be able to support a, you know, a natural self-maintaining Florida stream. Um, if it would fall down here, it would be more of a sheet flow like a wetland. And if you've got you know, too much stream power, it'll be an erosional gully. Um, so once you kind of figure those things out, you can use the empirical equations to give you your design parameters, like your floodplain geometry, your bank pool geometry, and ultimately how much space you're going to need to take up. What? It looks like I'm doing the observer training on my own. Oh, uh, yeah. I sent some email out. I said, I'm going to take off the air too to see what they work. I got family thing. I listen to that. I don't know. Usual. Trust. Coming in really loud on my part. Okay. Um, so then the next step after you've found out what your design parameters are is to look at the available land that you have. Do you have enough room for stream restoration? So this includes accounting for things like right of way, utility conflicts, existing structures, um, because it's really important that you have the room for that floodplain and um, can still have safe tie-ins to existing elevations. So then once you've designed your stream within the available landscape, uh, we run both 2D and 1D models um, or two-dimensional models um, like HECRAS or Rivermorph. Um, we can choose the correct materials, check for shear stresses, do any iterations in the design that we need. And then in the case of Joe's Creek, we um, compared the multiple different design alternatives to see um, how they measured up against each other. And then after that, you can do the 1D models like SWIM or ICPR. Um, and this screens the designs for offsite impacts, shows benefits for flooding, and then helps integrate the design into those municipal models. Um, another aspect we like to plan for is um, designing for resilience. Um, obviously, there's you know, many, many different ways that you can include resilience into designs. So I will just focus on two. Um, so as I mentioned, a lot of these urban streams that we're seeing are in coastal areas. So designing for tides and sea level rise are really important. Um, so it's important to establish your current specifications, but also the future conditions. And you can do that with you know, different models and forecasting methods. Um, our team has done a lot of research on plant assemblages and channel morphology that can adapt to these changing conditions and can handle you know, the increased flows and volumes and forces. 
Another thing our team has seen that it's really good to get ahead of the issue and to plan retreat out of those future flooding areas. And then you can use that space to have a more accommodating floodplain and be more resilient to those rising tides and flooding. Um, another thing we like to plan for, it's maybe not as common, um, but we want to be resilient to water quality changes too. We often see a lot of these urban creeks that have headwaters that are about to or are currently undergoing rapid development or major land use changes. Um, so if you're getting you know, new water quality inputs, you could potentially end up with water quality impairments that you didn't have before. Um, so we just like to make sure that we've got enhanced water treatment through all the different stream restoration surfaces, whether that's you know, the flood bench, the stream banks, you know, in the hyperreic zone. And this can really help be resilient to any potential watershed changes that come in the future. So I've touched on a lot of these throughout the presentation, but there really are a lot of benefits to natural channel stream restoration. Um, specifically going back to the Joe's Creek um, design example, when we were comparing the hard armoring, the forested banks and stream restoration options, the stream restoration scored highest across the board. It showed the greatest reduction in shear stresses, the natural materials used in stream restoration provided the same resistance to shear stresses as the hard armoring. Um, it provided the most additional flood storage volume, and it actually had a cost comparable to uh, riprap and gabion baskets. Um, stream restoration also provided the most additional benefits. Um, it's also worth noting that these rang true for um, the bank full flow all the way to the 100-year 24-hour storm. So these additional benefits of stream restoration, um, you're improving or creating new habitat. You can create recreational opportunities, whether that's kayaking, fishing, bird watching. Um, it really reduces the operation and maintenance needs and costs and reduces those needs for repairs. It can um, definitely reduce flooding impacts, improve resilience and improve water quality. Um, speaking of water quality, um, DEP is supportive of water quality credits for stream restoration. Um, historically and currently, it's been based more on a case-by-case -case basis with focused studies. Um, but we are right now working with DEP and stakeholders on our McCoy's Creek project in Jacksonville towards developing more standardized categorical reductions for these stream restoration projects. So we are, it is underway. Um, to summarize, these urban canals can often be subject to erosion and bank failures and have really high operation and maintenance costs, um, along with negative water quality, habitat, and flooding impacts. Um, and stream restoration can address most of these issues. Um, however, it's very important that the site has all the right conditions or the stream will not be able to be a self-maintaining natural Florida stream. Stream restoration can provide many additional benefits, whether that's ecological, social, or financial. And where possible, it is a very good BMP for water quality and flood control. And ultimately, stream restoration makes the entire drainage system more resilient to the wide variety of potential stressors that might be coming for Florida in the future. And with that, I just want to thank Pinellas County again. Joe's Creek was a super fun project to work on and all of the other uh, labs and groups and districts that helped us out with that project. And I can take any questions if there are any. All right, are there any questions for Megan? Marcus, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, I was just uh, curious if there's any pre and post monitoring that's done. I think you alluded to some aspects of it, mostly from the physical side, but um, on the biological assessment realm, is there any pre post monitoring done for these restoration sites? There should be. I'm relatively new to the stream team, so I'm kind of the wrong person to ask. Um, but I know for the one that we're doing on McCoy's Creek right now, there is a biological aspect as well as water quality. So they'll be doing, you know, SCIs and things like that. And they've been doing them before construction, so we can compare them. 
And Marcus, this is Stacy Day with Pinellas County. We are actually doing a monitoring right now upstream and downstream of this proposed stream restoration area in Joe's Creek. And um, you know, I, I think plans are just now starting to be underway for the design, but um, we've been monitoring um, some additional parameters at the request of DEP in Joe's Creek for a year now, and we'll continue to do that. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, if if uh, when those results are available, I'd be interested to see them. Um, in in a past life, I I did some stream work, and I know the biological endpoints are usually the the pie in the sky for at least from a regulatory perspective of of what you're trying to to achieve. And I know the urban streams are challenging for a number of reasons, and I was just curious if what monitoring was done and and what effects it had on the on the biological side. We'll let you know. Thanks. Appreciate it. Other questions for Megan? Mark, do you want to unmute or do you want me to ask your question? I can unmute. Uh, yeah, Mark Walton from uh, Swift Mud. Um, great presentation. Um, just curious, is there a, a threshold um, reach length for, for these sort of benefits to, to, to accrue or Similarly, if you have, um, you know, sort of very fragmented restoration along an urban stream, uh, because you, you know, you, you only have certain spots where you get the right of way, um, you know, does that does that affect, um, you know, how how much of these benefits you might uh, see? Yeah, obviously, if you've got you know an entire couple mile long continuous corridor, there's definitely a better you know, you're going to get more for your money there. But um, just, you know, the stream restoration and the floodplain creation and all of that, it's essential, it can essentially act as a, you know, like an LID BMP, wherever you put it. So there, there definitely is a threshold. I'm not sure what it is, um, but there are, you know, it doesn't have to be an entire stream worth of stream restoration to see benefits. And John Ryan notes that y'all are working with them in Sarasota County, and part of that effort is to develop a fisheries baseline um, before before a project begins. Yeah. Chris Kaufman is talking. Do you want to unmute and give some of that context, Chris? Sure. Um, so I am, well, the Noah Restoration Center is funding a portion of the McCoy's Creek uh, the project in Jacksonville, the uh, daylighting of the tidal portion of the creek. So we're funding design of that. And with that project, um, with wood and groundwork Jacksonville, we've, we were able to fund pre-restoration fishery sampling uh, for that portion of the creek. And it's hoped that we will be able to, um, if they get another grant for construction, that we would be able to fund the post-restoration fishery sampling. And many of you may know that tidal tributaries has been a focus of the program for quite some time. Um, there's a number of research projects we've done throughout Southwest Florida to, to implement some monitoring on these tidal creek systems. And then we've also partnered with the Southwest Florida Water Management District for a pilot project um, on channels A and G, where we're starting to see some of the some of the good benefits um, naturally recruiting up there. But this is um, something that we're that we're interested in. We know there's a number of these small streams throughout our watershed, and there's tremendous opportunity um, to to restore them to more natural conditions for all the multiple benefits that that Megan was um, mentioning. So we're also kind of putting together in our in our upcoming work plan. Um, a project that's geared towards providing some some training and support for local government maintenance crews that are going out to these um, urban streams and managing them currently just as floodways basically but um, hopefully we can help them understand that with some different techniques um, they can manage these systems for multiple benefits and hopefully we can have better outcomes as a result of that so Hopefully that's something that um, you all will be interested in partnering with us on um, in the future. Any other comments or questions for Megan? 
All right. Gonna hand it over to Aaron. Thanks, Megan, that was great. Um, next up on the agenda, we have um, Dr. Polster. She's a researcher with USF. She's gonna be giving us some preliminary results about um, their project to monitor for PFAS in Tampa Bay. Good morning. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, as Maya said, I'm Erin Polster. I'm with the University of South Florida, College of Marine Science. Uh, I basically focus on anthropogenic pollution and aquatic toxicology. I first want to extend my uh, thank you for extending the invitation for us to present our research on PFAS findings in Tampa Bay. So to start, I would like to to, I'm going to clarify some terminology. So the abbreviation PFOS actually stands for multiple per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. So it does not refer or stand for one particular compound and not to be confused with PFOS, P-F-O-S, which is a one particular compound. So PFOS is a PFOS, but PFOS is not specifically PFOS. Um, is that makes sense? And is everybody thoroughly confused? If so, this presentation will make absolute sense. So to let me just get my maybe not. I was hoping for the highlighter. We could we could see your mouse moving on the screen. I could see that, but it's for some reason I can't. Oh, here it is. Here it is. I wanted that laser pointer, and go. So, okay. So just a little bit of background on uh, PFOS um, and the perfluorinated substances. They were first manufactured back in. Uh, the 1940s, and since then, there are more than 4,000 of these compounds that are widely used as polymers and surfactants in a variety of commercial and industrial applications. Some of the more common uses are found in personal care products, uh, firefighting foams, water resistant and water um, um, waterproof clothing, stain resistant applications on carpets and furniture, um, and particularly non-stick cookware and fast food packaging. Um, the chemical structure of these compounds is basically a, a carbon fluorine uh, backbone, which is happens to be the strongest in nature. So this basically means that these compounds are virtually non-biodegradable, so they will exist in the environment for hundreds to thousands of years, and they are metabolically inert. So Ultimately, these, um, they're environmentally persistent and they're easily absorbed by uh, organisms. So, and they also have a very high biomagnific biomagnification potential. And the toxicity of these compounds was first or published back in the 50s. So we've known about the toxicity of these compounds for at least 70 years. Um, and since then, over the years, uh, the, the reports on toxicity in both animals and aquatic uh, organisms and humans has increased over the years. Um, by 1980, it was first detected in um, drinking water. And then by uh, 2010, it's been detected in all environmental media globally, including um, soil, water, wildlife, and humans. And so the toxicity of these particular compounds um, has created them or has turned them into a major environmental and public health concern, basically due to their associations with multiple cancers and a number of, um, of uh, morbidities, including reproductive, behavioral, neurological, immunological, cardiovascular, and respiratory effects. And these, all these effects have also been reported in 
uh, animals and in wild uh, aquatic life. So environmental sources for PFAS compounds are particularly uh, local sources or long range transport processes. So if you happen to live in an area that's next to a manufacturing plant of PFAS, your local sources might be the direct discharge into waterways. Uh, for other communities that may not live next to a particular manufacturing plant, the local sources tend to be from consumer products, consumer product disposals, wastewater treatment plants, um, and, and landfills. And uh, the, any area that is using um, highly used applications of firefighting foams, and those areas consist of uh, uh, military bases, airports, um, possibly Coast Guard, Coast Guard stations. Um, so those are particular sources that we in Florida may, may uh, uh, be exposed to. So PFOSs in Florida were first identified back in the 1990s when firefighting foams were released into a river that caused seabird illnesses. And later, about a decade later, it was first reported in drinking water. The map over here on the right is actually some of the available studies on drinking water concentrations in Florida that was just published last year. Um, and it's not just drinking water, but surface water and ground well, groundwater wells. And what you notice is that all of the majority of the areas where we have data, they are well above the advisory level put out by USPA, uh, US EPA at 70 parts per trillion. One area over here in Brevard County, um, the Patrick Air Force Base actually had levels exceeding 4 million parts per trillion. What we know about PFAS in Florida wildlife is uh, fairly limited, um, other than the seabirds that uh, became ill back in the 90s from the river discharge. There have been some published reports on dolphin hepatic tissues, manatees, alligators, and mullet. And these latter three um, studies were actually done over on Merritt Island, which is near that Patrick uh, uh, Air Force Base with the 4 million um, parts per trillion in the groundwater. Um, one interesting point here is manatee plasma. Um, these animals are herbivores and pretty low on the trophic hierarchy. So um, for them to have these relatively high levels, they were actually comparable to predators predators in their environment. And these were manatees specifically from that Brevard County area. So other than these three or four studies um, on wildlife in Florida, this is all we pretty much know. It's pretty scarce in the literature. So getting to our particular study, our goal was to actually um, look at fish and sediments in Tampa Bay in order to identify areas of concern. Um, we focused on likely source areas and with the help, um, shout out to Maya and Gary who helped us select sites based on their random stratification methods that they use for their baywide monitoring. Um, we selected eight sites around the bay. Um, the first site, Salt Creek here, which is near a Coast Guard facility or where they have the boats docked there and there's actually a fire training facility in the lake that drains into Salt Creek. Um, we also looked at Palmetto wastewater treatment plant, um, the tire reef. We selected this site because the tires, uh, tires were manufactured with PFOS compounds, so the potential for leaching was of interest. We looked at the Pi Largo wastewater treatment plant, No Bay, Clearwater wastewater treatment plant, uh, Tampa Bay International Airport, Howard Curran wastewater treatment plant, and the Tampa Fire and Police facility, training facility up in the K Bay. Um, so the, gr the green triangles are where we selected uh, sediment samples, and the blue circles are where we collected fish samples throughout the bay. We have a total of 17 sediment samples. And for fish, we collected again, we collected uh, last summer, the, the sediment samples were also collected last August. 
fish was collected uh, through July through September. Um, and we were able to accomplish all of this even through COVID. And we, we wouldn't have been able to accomplish the sediment sampling without the support of the Environmental Protection Commission. So thank you all there. Um, so far to date, we've analyzed 83 mussel tissues from 16 species. Um, these particular species range from benthic species, the catfish, to bait fish, reef fish, and some commercially important fish like sea trout. So sediment extractions. Again, we uh, extracted about 17 samples of uh, sediments, and we used a widely known method from the ASTM, which was basically a simple process of using freeze-dried sediment, um, extractions. This is obviously a little more simplified, but we did some solvent extractions and then filtering, and then it's pretty much ready for um, injection into the instrument. For fish muscle extraction, so we primarily focused on the muscle because uh, eventually, want, we want to calculate human risk, human health risk, uh, based on seafood consumption from the levels that we measure in the fillets. So, two grams of wet weight muscle tissue from species uh, we extracted um, using a combination. We we did go through some method development and optimization using a few different methods. But this ultimately uses some solvent extractions and then finally some solid phase extraction cleanup here. We analyzed all the extracts using an LC tandem mass spectrometry. We, our target analytes were 25 of these PFOS compounds. And I will note that all of these compounds were detected in at least one sample uh, from all the samples collected in Tampa Bay. Uh, this graph figure down here is basically our percent recoveries uh, per fish species and sediment. And what you know, basically this is just saying that the methods have been validated. Um, these are our surrogate standards that all fell in within, within acceptable ranges of 75 to 130% recoveries. So moving forward into the sediment results, Sediment concentrations of, of perfluorinated compounds range from approximately 40 to 3,000 parts per trillion. This graph here on the left is basically your concentration of PFOS and dry weight against specific sites on the X within each of the particular bay regions. And what you'll note here is that the Pi Largo wastewater treatment plant had higher concentrations than all of their locations and were 30 times higher than the Palmetto wastewater treatment plant. This graph here is again the concentration against just the particular bay. So uh, these are mean concentrations of these particular sites um, within each of the bay. And again, just points out that the highest levels were uh, in Old Tampa Bay, primarily because of this wastewater treatment plant. Sediment profiles. The sediment profiles in the bay were primarily dominated by PFOS, which is colored here in blue. PFOS is that one particular more common legacy perfluorinated compound. It was detected in 100% of the sediment samples with concentrations ranging from 9 to approximately 2,000 parts per trillion. Again, Pi Lego, Pi, the Pi Largo wastewater treatment plant had the highest concentrations and were two orders magnitude higher than the Terracilla Bay Palmetto wastewater treatment plant. The other note here is just basically there are some slight uh, profile differences between locations. For instance, this Pi Largo site has some higher levels of this compound PFHSK or X. SK, which was a uh, replacement compound for uh, PFOA. PFOA is another more common legacy compound. And going into the preliminary fish muscle tissues, the fish PFOS, total PFOS concentrations in fish ranged from about 40 to 33,000 uh, parts per trillion. 
The highest levels again were um, were found in Old Tampa Bay. These this was the mean concentrations of all species, which were significantly higher than Mid Tampa Bay as well as Lower Tampa Bay. And the Mid Tampa Bay mean concentrations of fish were also significantly higher than the Lower Tampa Bay locations. And uh, what you'll note here is the species, the highest levels are mostly in benthic species and the um, upper level trophic, uh, trophic position predators. So this suggests a couple of things. The benthic species may be more exposed to the compounds that are um, sequestering into the sediment, whereas for these upper level fish, there's probably a possibility of biomagnification. Um, I will also note that these significant differences between sites could also be a species specific thing, um, you know, a result of specific species specific metabolism and uptake because uh, over here we have some more upper level species, whereas down here we have uh, some bait fish and uh, smaller species. For the sediment profiles in the muscle tissue, uh, sorry, fish profiles, fish muscle. Um, what we noted again is PFOS, that one particular compound was detected in 100% of the fish, and it is dominating the profiles in the fish as well. Um, co concentrations range from almost 600 to 30,000 parts per trillion wet weight. Um, and there are also some slight signature differences between sites again and possibly uh, species, the thread herring, seems to be um, accumulating more of this fluorotelomere 6-2. Um, and this one particular site in the Apollo Peach power plant seems to have some higher levels of uh, PFDS, which was also a uh, replacement compound for some of the legacy compounds. So if we were to compare some sediment, uh, the sediment concentrations to fish, uh, we do have a wide range of variability, but overall, the mean concentrations um, in, in all the species were approximately 11 times higher than the sediment dry weight concentrations. Both the fish and the sediment had uh, similar profiles. You can see they were both dominated by that one PFOS concentration uh, compound, um, but there were a little bit of differences. PFOS, PFOA, um, was found in higher frequency in the sediment than it was in the fish samples. In fish, it was less, it constituted approximately less than 1% of their tissue concentrations. And there were some other differences where this PFHSK was found in sediments, not so much in the, um, in the fish, and PFDS was more frequently detected in the fish as opposed to the sediment. So if we're to put these, the fish levels in the Tampa Bay fish compared to fish consumption advisories that are available, they're not really trivial levels. We see that some of the um, sport fish sea trout here fall within perhaps a range that we may want to consider publishing um, or you know issuing health guidelines or consumption guidelines. Some of these other fish may, we may not consume, but the other thing I want to note about this graph is that um, these upper or the bigger species here um, are accumulating more. So the important part here is that we need to collect more of these recreational and sports, um, fisheries, important fish that we eat in larger class sizes so that we can see if where they fall within this range. Uh, the other thing about this graph is these levels these advisory levels here are from one uh, state, Michigan, um, that has available consumption advisories. There's a few other states, Alabama and Wisconsin, I believe, that have issued seafood advisory guidelines, as well as Canada, but they're all different. And I imagine that these levels and guidelines are gonna change as toxicology data becomes available. So in summary, basically these PFAS chemicals are known as 
forever chemicals because they do not biodegrade and they biomagnify. There's evidence that they biomagnify up the food chain. Uh, this graph here is from this particular study of a few of the uh, compounds that we did measure. And there's some moderate, uh, significant and moderate um, correlation between uh, the length of the fish. So they're increasing with size, which means, you know, this, these levels are going to increase as the fish gets bigger. Um, the PFAS levels in fish were in order of magnitude higher than sediments. Uh, we noted that uh, benthic species had high levels, could be because of the exposure in the sediments, as well as the higher trophic levels, which um, had higher levels, which could be indicating biomagnification. Um, PFOS was the dominant compound, and profiles did differ across species and sites. And the highest levels for both sediment and fish were found in the upper uh, uh, Old Tampa Bay area. So for future directions, our, our specific next steps in this study um, is to calculate the human health risk from seafood consumption in the tissue concentrations that we measured in the fish in Tampa Bay. Um, what I believe we really need for future uh, is to uh, determine the extent of the food web impacts in the Tampa Bay. And to do this, I would like to uh, continue measuring species, including invertebrates and upper trophic level species, and combine those with stable isotopes to look at how the levels are uh, increasing with trophic levels. Um, from there, we can calculate this trophic magnification factor and bioaccumulation factors, as well as biomagnification factors. And we can look at and predict actually how these compounds, this in particular is PFOS, how they are biomagnifying or predict how they're going to biomagnify at a particular site in Tampa Bay. Um, this, all of this information is critical for resource managers to determine if these advisories are needed to be issued in this region, especially for the recreational fisheries and subsistence fisheries. Uh, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, our funding agency, the uh, Tampa Bay Estuary Research Fund, um, the Tampa Bay Estuary Program um, for helping with site selection, uh, the Environmental Protection Commission that helped us collect all the sediment samples. Here they are here. Um, um, here's some other, uh, uh, Steve Morowski and Tom Ash, our, our fish brigade out there, and our US support, our uh, USF support team, um, Kylie Rubo and Cheryl Dilbert. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Erin. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Tara, do you want to unmute and ask it yourself, or would you like me to ask for you? Thanks, Maya. Um, I just was looking at the locations of the wastewater treatment plants, and weren't there two of them in Old Tampa Bay? I just didn't know uh, what your thoughts were on if that was maybe a main driver of why the highest levels were in Old Tampa Bay. Um, well, they were really high at that high Largo wastewater treatment plant, uh, that particular site. Um, but the, the, the concentrations in that bay varied. Uh, we did have two wastewater treatment plants and the airport. Um, but the highest site, I think the levels in Tampa Bay are being driven by that high Largo wastewater treatment plant site. Just just to clarify, Aaron, you know, the, the sediment samples were in association to areas where those wastewater treatment plants discharge. There's also the St. Pete Clearwater Airport in the vicinity of that region. So can't really tie it to any one treatment plant. They're just in the vicinity of, of known surface water discharges. Yes. Right. So I would be really careful about presenting that, Aaron, um, because yes, they're kind of located in those areas, but you're not directly treating, uh, measuring effluent or anything like that. So to tie to tie that directly to the wastewater treatment plant or um, you know the airport or anything else like that is probably early. Too soon. Correct. I agree. Take back everything I said. <laughs> Those are just locational markers for everybody. It's not tying causality to specific um, facilities. 
We've got a lot of accolades coming in, but not, not too many questions. Um, is any, anybody knocking around a question in your head that you want to ask, Aaron? This is a, a new and kind of hot topic uh, within the region, so I thought it would be good to get some of their preliminary information before you all. Clear as mud? I have a question. Go ahead, Dan. So this is this is really, uh, you know, I have a ton of questions, but just a general overall question I want to ask is, this this study that you did is very comprehensive. And how long did it take, Erin? Well, we collected last summer, and I've been analyzing since. Wow. So ideally, I would like to do additional sampling so we can get some uh, temporal temporal idea of how these levels are changing over time yeah yeah so the next step is to just continue sampling and, and confirmation of results and um, and then what happens with the data and and who is it going to be presented to and what kind of follow-up is expected so uh, yeah, our next step are to finalize the fish. We still have a couple of sites to sample. Um, and then there's the extraction data analysis, finalize the data. Um, this data will hopefully be published in peer review scientific journals. It is available for anybody that is interested. We're happy to share with resource managers. Um, uh, again, we're hoping to get funding to continue this work. I think it's important considering there are, is very little information on environmental levels in Florida, actually in the U.S. Um, in particular, but um, so specifically Florida, we would like to continue this. Well, the, it's a great body of work that you've done, and you should be proud, and, and thank you for presenting. I would like to get uh, anything that you publish on this study uh, for my department, Nellis County Utilities, if it's available. Absolutely. And maybe Maya Thank can you. provide your contact information for me. I'm happy to do that, Dan. Thank you. Uh, just, you know, this is this is something that was identified when we updated the CCMP back in 2017 as an area that, you know, you know, one of these contaminants of concern that we don't really have enough information on. So um, we're starting to sort of fill out and address some of the research agenda. I'm sure that uh, this work will initiate further questions and, um, you know, we don't necessarily know where we're, where we're going with everything yet. The first step is to, to really sort of uh, figure out what, what we've got out there, what we're, what we're dealing with here in Tampa Bay. And so this is a project that's important um, first piece of information in that, in that regard. Well, Aaron, I'm not seeing any more questions, but we really appreciate you coming and sharing your results with us. Um, uh, and the next the next topic that we're going to talk about is um, Gary Rollerson's going to talk about some of those um, special special study sites for the benthic monitoring that we do. Aaron's presentation is a good example of um, how, how we leverage those special study sites uh, for specific research questions and issues in Tampa Bay. And um, we get to pick them all the time. So uh, he's looking for some help picking the next round. Thanks, Maya. Good morning, y'all. So I'll start off by uh, raising my hand, Aaron and Steve, if y'all need any assistance on the on the fish sampling, I'll, I'll uh, I'm Definitely willing to help out there whenever that goes forward. And like Maya was saying, um, the the work that Aaron and Steve did alongside of EPC as part of our annual Benthic assessment uh, program. This was our one of our special projects for last year. And so I'm going to go over some of that information very quickly, and then see if we can um, talk about some uh, some of the projects that we could look at for the next couple of years. So EPC leads um, the group, including Manatee County, Pinellas County, that does benthic assessment for us on an annual basis. They actually do uh, assessment of percent silt clay, do a chemistry analysis, looking at a series of uh, contaminants within the bay, 
and then also identif identification of benthic invertebrates in their samples. And they do about 44 randomized samples in the in that stratified um, set that's that uh, we all know and love. But they also have 20 samples every year that are what we call special projects. And I'll show you what's what we've done in in the recent past on that. But thinking about this on um, the uh, on on an operating timeline. So Aaron, as Aaron mentioned, they went out in I think August of last year for that uh, for that benthic sampling. We will be seeing the, uh, the results from the benthic side of that in December, as long as we're you know we're under COVID and all of those fun things. So that's always a, always potential. But general, generally, it's it's nearly a year and a half from the time they take the samples to the time that they uh, that they produce final results. Um, and I, I didn't put a link of it link in here, but in 2020, um, EPC produced a, a 25 year uh, retrospective on the uh, on the work that they've done for the larger um, randomized samples. But again, what we need to do is think about this in the context of you know that year that year and a half process looking out what um and so so uh, we're trying to do a little bit of planning with regards to the sampling that we would like to see this map shows um the special projects for basically the last 11 years from 2009 to well, 12 years from 2009 to 2020 so we have actually pretty good distribution throughout the bay this is a single color for all for all of the samples. We've actually um, they've actually gone up into Clearwater, working in Pinellas County, um, Bogusiega Bay, Lower Upper Tampa Bay, all of um, Hillsboro, and uh, Hillsboro and Old Tampa Bay um, up in the Manatee River. That was a couple of years ago. We did some some uh, pre work for oyster monitoring. I think those samples were delayed to COVID. We'll be getting some information on that. We'll be able to provide that to uh, Damon Moore and Aaron Strazeri for some of their uh, oyster restoration work going forward. Last uh, last year, this is the, uh, the the tire reef that Aaron meant, Aaron Polster mentioned, and then some of the, the sites around the bay um, that were in coordination with those PFAS work. And we'll be uh, looking, getting that data again this uh, this December. And so thinking just, just real briefly about um, potential special projects, we have um, Old Tampa Bay, it's a, you know, it's, it's a very important focus for the program right now, thinking about the, uh, the water quality and seagrass issues we have um, with regards to pyrodinium, interest to in seeing um, how this reflect, is reflected in the, uh, in, in the sediments. A couple of um, inlets are suggested for sediment quality action plans within, our, within the 2017 CCMP, so that's the Largo Inlet, in the in, coming into Old Tampa Bay and McKay Bay, and so this um, utilizing some of these special project uh, samples for those two um, locations would help uh, help forward the the action items listed in the CCMP. Some other interests that we have are looking at some of the habitat restoration projects the that have occurred within the bay, the the sediment filling over the past decades. Uh, there's one in the Big Island that's near the um, the St. Pete Clearwater Airport and the and the McDill runway that was next to it that was partially filled circa 2004 2005. It'd be interesting to go back because we do have some earlier records from those sites to see how they are doing more recently. Also, the uh, you know thinking about the the Courtney Campbell cut that was just uh, just created. We we did we do have some data from the Bay Point hole that's on the northern side of that from the uh, dredge toll assessment a couple of years back. So we could revisit that in a couple of years. I don't think that's quite ready. We'd like to give the cut probably a little bit more time to equilibrate. And also another um, option would be the, you know, Piney Point Bishop Harbor regarding some of the different issues that we that we recognize there. But right now, you know, and um, that's pretty much all I have. I'd like to start generating some suggestions. If you have anything to add to that, I've got an Excel spreadsheet that I've uh, basically compiled some of that information. But if anybody has some suggestions of what uh, what data gaps you recognize, I'd, I'd appreciate uh, having those uh, put in and we can discuss them. We have about uh, two months from right now till May, June timeframe where we um, where, where we work with EPC to identify these the uh, these locations for the August to October samplings.
So does anyone have an idea of location that would benefit from some additional benthic monitoring or a project where benthic monitoring might might help you? Um, we can discuss them now or you can provide those via email to Gary. The floor is open for suggestions. Or if you're happy with this list, that's yeah, another option. Emma's, Emma's um, do you wanna do you wanna unmute and discuss your idea about Felipe Park, Emma? Oh uh, yeah, can you hear me? We can. Awesome. Yeah. So with the county, we actually installed a living shoreline at Felipe Park, um, and in light of that, we've been doing a lot of extra water quality monitoring along that shoreline. Um, so I do think it would be interesting to collect some sediment samples uh, there as well. Um, so that would encompass the area around Fleet Bay Park, uh, Safety Harbor, and a little bit of old Tampa Bay. Um, so that's sort of what I was thinking, um, at least on the Pinellas County side of things. Awesome. We appreciate your suggestion. Awesome. Thanks. Gary, it's Randy Ronalds. Um, uh, does this uh, pertain mostly to unconsolidated sediments uh, or does it also include um, hard bottom? We can sit, Randy, I think they can sample around hard bottom, but it's a, it, 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 they, are, they are doing set, uh, sediment sampling. Okay, yeah, I know in the past they've done some scrapings and all of hard bottom, but I wasn't sure on this particular application. Like for the epifaunal surveys or something else? Well, I was thinking about um, the end funnel. I have a way of sampling the rock and dissolving the rock and it leaves the uh, um, animals that were inside. And I've done that over in Texas. And uh, whenever people mitigate for hard bottom damage, it's, we, we like to argue that there's a whole uh, endolithic community that's not considered. You know, if they talk about not moving, we like to try to get them to move the rock rather than put in quarry stone or something else. And it would give us more, um, a better argument if we could show the incredible species richness and biomass that sometimes is in the rock. There are a lot of polychaetes and clams and all that bore in there and things that nestle in there. And so um, I've always wanted to look at what's in the rock, say, you know, down Terracea or somewhere like that. And uh, we could help with the sampling and the dissolution of the rock. Even things that have shells that dissolve, the organic matrix often is detailed enough that you can you can identify them. Some echinoderms I've done and all that before, but it's just an idea. That could be a, another project though outside of this. So I don't want to put, spend a lot of time on it in this discussion. Yep, appreciate it. Any other ideas for Gary? Chris, you want to unmute? Sure, yeah, hey Gary. Um, I just typed in a, an idea. It kind of follows up to some of the conversation you and I have had about looking at comparing Calerpa proliferance uh, beds with seagrass beds. And I think it might be interesting to tie in a benthic component to that. Um, so, you know, identifying areas where we've had either an increase or a persistence of Calerpa, Old Tampa Bay, maybe off Ford Wolf Branch, those kind of areas, or, or even McDill. Um, and then just comparing that with like adjacent seagrass meadows to see what kind of benthic characteristics we can compare and contrast. Okay, that, that makes, appreciate that one. Any other thoughts right now? I'm not seeing anything else in the, in the chat. Um, oh, I, hey, Mike, I got an idea. Gary, can hey, you hear me? Hey, how you doing? Good, thanks. Hey, listen, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, you always hear me plugging the same thing, but if you're interested in helping um, understand the effectiveness of like the swim restoration projects and other folks that are doing restoration around Tampa Bay, I would suggest you pick any of those sites and you've got, you know, 70 to 100 different sites you could go to and, and do your mythic sampling and then follow it up over the years to see how things change. It's a great suggestion. Thanks, Brant. I think Gary's camera's frozen, but he's yeah. hearing you. He's typing. I'm hearing? <laughs> are it, can you all hear me right now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I'll just turn my camera off then. You don't want to um, see my face anyways. <laughs> um, Tiffany, do you want to unmute and share your idea? 
Um, yeah, sure. I just recently um, learned about this one and went and checked it out. But at E.G. Simmons Park, they installed this big living shoreline solution um, structures. And supposedly there's a bunch of sediment accumulation, um, a lot of shoreline growth, and then a ton of baby horseshoe crabs and um, their food sources, maybe. So just learning about it, but that might be a spot. Great, thank you. All right, Gary, I'm not seeing anything else come in, um, but you all have hopefully have Gary's Gary's email. If not, we can put it in the chat. And, and if you have other ideas for potential benthic monitoring uh, locations for special study sites, send them Gary's way. So um, next up, we have Marcus Beck. He's going to talk about some of the open science tools he's been developing to analyze the seagrass transect data that we all collect um, throughout the region. We were hopeful that we'd be able to share with you the um, annual aerial or the biannual aerial seagrass surveys from the Water Management District, but it's taking them a little bit longer than um, we'd initially thought to process and finalize those results. So this is sort of uh, your, your teaser for the data that we do have to be thinking about seagrass in Tampa Bay. All righty. Well, thanks, Maya. Good morning, everybody. Um, so recently, I have been, I guess over the last six months or so, been diving into the transect data that has been collected for uh, a couple decades now in Tampa Bay. and. Um, Obviously, it's a great resource, uh, but if you've heard me talk before about open science, um, I think this is one of those data sets that's just sort of ripe for developing new tools and different ways to assess the data sets to make it more accessible and uh, as a source of information for really informing uh, change in our bay, not just the, the past successes, but what's happening now as, as uh, we enter sort of a, a new era of of the estuary program. So I'll be talking a little bit about those, those products today, um, mostly showcasing, I guess, uh, the dashboard as, as the key product here. I'll do a live demo in a little bit, but um, my goals are to excite and motivate as always. Uh, I want to talk about some of the open science products we've been developing around these transects, um, sort of giving you a flavor for what they can do uh, and also how they can be used to access these data on your own, uh, that being a, a key component of what we're trying to do to open up the, the products. And then as Maya alluded, I'll be giving you a brief overview of some of the status and trends we're seeing in some of these seagrass data, uh, strictly from the, the transect perspective. So um, Open Science 101, I always like to remind everybody about what this is about and why it's so important. Um, sort of the three facets of Open Science for us as a program are really focused around opening the data, uh, making it accessible to others, opening the process behind which we take the data and translate it to information, and then open products that you all can use to, to consume that information. So that's, that's the main focus here. And my philosophy about this is I like to view it as a cake. Everyone loves cake, so this is a, an appropriate metaphor. But um, being that, you know, the estuary program is sort of this sitting at the nexus of sort of the technical side and the stakeholder side and the partner side, we like to develop products that speak to all different facets of that. And open science can really uh, meet those goals because um, they're hierarchical where, you know, the, there's this sort of strong foundation at the bottom that sets the technical basis, the research community behind this. We saw many great presentations today that, that are building that foundation, but um, everything sort of moves out from there and all of the pieces are interconnected. So we can't have, you know, reporting products in the middle or educational fact sheets at the top without that strong foundation. And the entire open science ethos is meant to sort of connect all of these components in different ways. And um, I've shown this graphic before many times uh, to this group and others, but this is sort of a, a distilled workflow that we like to use when we're developing these products that is sort of the literal way how we, we sort of make this cake into practice. And so 
at the foundation here, we have you know uh, data sources that are coming from our partners. There's the science that, that's going behind how to synthesize that information. Uh, but we're putting it out there in ways that are accessible to others, discoverable to others, developing tools that anyone can use. And we're um, creating this information on front-facing web products, whether it be uh, two-page synthesis reports or dashboards, uh, things like that, that make it more accessible. This is actually a workflow that I've shown before that we use to develop the water quality report card. But the same principles apply to these transect data sets that I'll talk about in a second. Um, we're, we're tapping into the data source and using that to feed the dashboard as well as some other uh, web products I'll get into in a little bit later. So just a quick uh, reminder about the data sets we do have for seagrass in Tampa Bay. Um, the coverage maps provided by the district are going to be our, our sole source for assessing our coverage goals uh, approximately every two years as they come out. Um, this is based on photo interpretation of aerial imagery. It gives us an idea of acreage of seagrass uh, throughout the bay. And as I said, it's updated every two years. So we're anticipating the, the most recent round, the 2020 data, to be released uh, hopefully next month. Uh, contrast that with the transect data. Uh, this is information that has been around for quite a while, not quite as long as the coverage maps, but this is basically field data where um, partners go out every year at about 60 locations and do these transect surveys where you can get an idea of um, not just how much seagrass is there, but what species are there and uh, where the locations are in the bay. And so this is kind of a complementary line of information with the coverage maps that um, we can use to um, uh, sort of support that information in different ways, uh, more to the species level. Uh, obviously, because this is field data, it's not as sort of spatially, um, uh, the coverage isn't as large as the coverage maps, but it does give us this sort of ground truth uh, information that we can use to assess species changes over time. So as I said, I'm focusing mostly on the transect data now. Um, this is just a map of where these transect locations are, um, looking at the starting location and the, the general direction that the transect are meant to proceed each year, uh, and the responsible parties that are collecting this information. So uh, through Gary's efforts, you know, we sort of facilitate these, these sampling efforts every year. We have training to make sure people know the protocols that they're supposed to be using to do this sampling. Uh, but we really rely on our partners to collect this information. We're, of course, uh, grateful for that. And, and hopefully um, we'll use that information to make sense of what's going on in these communities over time. Um, and what's cool about this is that these locations have been sampled every year for about the last 20 years. So we can sort of look at changes over time at these specific sites. Um, and so just to get into some of the open science products we're developing for these transects, um, I'm going to start at the top of the cake. In other words, what is your access point to getting to these, these different products? Uh, this is on our website here. If you've been to the data visualization side of our web page, uh, you'll see there's multiple cards that are sort of topically focused. Uh, there's one on there now focused on seagrass assessment. And this is going to be where you are um this is going to be your first stop shop for getting this information so we have just a general overview of what the, the transect data is all about links to the dashboards uh links to um a uh, summary assessment report card here and then um links to some of the technical products on the right here so um some of the open source tools the dashboard and some of the technical documents um we have a lot of technical documents supporting this but these are just some of the um a uh, good starting place for just getting some good background. I will say that we are also working on a transect web page or a seagrass web page on the water atlas right now. Um, that's going to be a more detailed, in-depth overview of these these monitoring programs and the data that comes out of it and some of the products uh, that is probably going to come out um, I think later this month. Uh, but and just so I'm just saying look forward to that. Uh, but the main difference between that page and this page is that this one on our web page is more uh, showcasing the open science product. So I just want to contrast those two so it's clear uh, the goals behind them. So that is the open science web page. Um, really again kind of the nexus of all of these products is the programming tools that we've developed 
to ingest the data and summarize it moving forward. And so, again, if you've seen me talk, uh, you've probably heard me mention TBEP tools. This is an R-based package that is open source. It's on GitHub. Anybody can download it and access it. Um, it's something that we use internally primarily to summarize a lot of our reporting products under the CCMP. Um, but as I said, recently in the last six months, we've been including some functions in this package to work specifically with transect data. So all of the products I'm talking about today, the, the, uh, the summary graphics, the dashboard are all rolled into this package as a means to sort of do that, not just to make our lives easier, but again, if someone else wants to download this package and do this on their own, they can do that. Uh, just to show you uh, how this works, this is just a snippet of, of a couple lines of code from the package. Um, looking at the um, uh, importing the transect data. So this is one way you can get this information. Um, really in just two lines of code, you can load the library and import all of the transect data. This actually taps into the uh, the water atlas where they have this hosted. It pulls in a JSON file that they've, they've served up for us. And with this code, you can import it into your, your R session and, and use the data moving forward. So in just a few like seconds, it downloads almost um, or just over 130,000 records of the entire time series of the transect data that we have. So with this function, you can get information about when the sampling occurred, what transect it was at, uh, what sites along the transect. These are these are um, uh, sampled every uh, uh, 10 meters or so. Uh, what species are there, and then what the the measure was for that particular species. So it's, I think, a great way to get your hands on the data if you want to do some downstream analysis. Uh, another function we have that, uh, again, thinking about moving forward for how we do these synthesis summary products, this is just another step in the, the workflow. We have this function for analyzing um, frequency occurrence of the different species along the transect. So when you do import that transect data, you can run this function to basically sort of smush all of the sampling points along a transect to estimate uh, frequency occurrence and average uh, brown blanquet abundance for the different species. So all this is is just removing that sort of site uh, meter aspect on there and just aggregating all the results at the transect level by species. And moving forward, um, we do have some summary functions to actually look at the data. So I'm just going to show you a few. These are actually graphics you'll see on the dashboard. Uh, but again, if you want to use the software to do this, you can do this on your own. Um, but what this shows is essentially the entire record of um, sampling that's been done at this particular transect. So this is the one I believe that's in between the Courtney Camp, uh, the Causeway and the Howard Franklin Bridge. But we have basically going back to about 2000 when this sampling started up to sampling that happened last year and then uh, placements along the transect going from the about the shoreline to uh, where the the seagrass edge happens and so the points show individual species and uh, the size of the point shows approximate relative abundance of the species where it was sampled at that place. So you can see a lot of information here, um, you know, what species are dominant, how the species distributions change over time. Um, it's, you know, um, interactive graphic, you can zoom in, um, you can pan around, uh, good fun there. You can isolate different species. So if you don't want to look at all the species at once, you could subsample there. So um, this is, I, again, I think just a, a good way to sort of really open up the transect data in a way that, that lets you really get a sense of how these changes have happened over time in a way that I don't think we've really had uh, available to us in the past. So this is one function that lets you look at site level information across all of the points on a transect, but we can also look at a more general summary looking at these changes in frequency occurrence over time. So this is the same data for that same site, but now we've again just condensed all of the quadrats uh, along that transect for a particular date to um, the samples that happened on that date. So now we see again time on the x-axis, but how the frequency occurrence of the species has changed throughout that whole time series. And so this is again just a nice way to look at how uh, species have evolved over time along that transect. 
Uh, again, using kind of an interactive approach, you can isolate and remove different species, um, you know, depending on what your interest is. So this is looking at uh, individual transects, but we want to sort of step back and maybe make these more general statements about what's happening uh, with frequency occurrence of different species across the entire bay. And so we also have functions for that. Um, this one looks at essentially um, a bay-wide average of frequency occurrence for major species throughout the entire period of record across all transects. And so we have uh, the total frequency occurrence on the top. So we can see not only that that's increasing over time, that's great. Uh, we see it for individual species down here. Um, you can isolate ones um, that you want to care, you know, you want to look at in particular, just like the other plots. Um, and this is again a summary across all base segments. There's there's actually options to look at one base segment at a time with this function, or pairs of base segments, whatever you want to do. I'll actually show you how to do that on the dashboard. But this is again meant to just give that high level summary. And then because we like report cards so much, uh, we have a report card for uh, the seagrass frequency occurrence estimates that are is meant to sort of complement some of our existing uh, report cards that we have. And so this is showing you uh, essentially average frequency occurrence across all species for the entire bay and then separated by bay segment here. Um, you'll notice that the color scheme is a little different than some of that, that red, green, yellow uh, color scheme you might be familiar with with some of our other reports, but uh, we did this on purpose because we don't really necessarily have, you know, solid breakpoints of, you know, what would define a red versus a green and that really kind of defines people's um, thoughts and opinions about what uh, the status of seagrass is and we didn't want to impose that in this particular graphic. So the colors here are more of a neutral um, color gradient and it's continuous color gradient where there's no specific breakpoints. So this is really meant to just give you an idea of relative changes in frequency occurrence without sort of putting some some value statements on there by putting some colors uh, that are that are going to maybe uh, make people a little more um, concerned about like red for example. So um, what you'll see here is that um, looking at the 2019 to 2020 uh, change uh, you do see kind of a drop across the board in frequency occurrence and that is a point of concern. Um, you'll see that in Old Tampa Bay here, um, Hillsborough Bay, where there's not really a whole lot of seagrass to start with, but you do see that drop in then Middle Tampa Bay as well. Um, not so much in some of the lower Tampa Bay areas or Boca Ciega Bay, but um, this is kind of uh, something to think about is this, this recent drop in frequency occurrence. And then when we do have the coverage estimates from the district to report to you, um, I would sort of look at these estimates relative to those and sort of seeing how they can sort of complement each other and, and sort of inform our understanding moving forward about where we need to focus efforts to address these issues. Um, so that's just sort of a quick tour of some of the functions that are available in the package. I encourage you to check out the vignette, which is on the uh, package website. Um, we have multiple vignettes that are sort of these long form plain language descriptions of how to install the software, how to use the functions, what they do, some of the assumptions behind the functions, um, some of the options to use the functions for um, tweaking the output. Um, this would be a good place to start if you just want to get your, you know, on the ground running for using these tools. Um, and so moving to sort of the middle part of the open science cake is this dashboard. Um, this would be a nice place to go to if you want absolutely nothing to do with R, which I get it, um, that, that might be a, a more accessible way for people to access this information. So we do have a dashboard now that, again, um, reports a lot of the same information you can get out of the package, but does it in a nice um, clickable GUI style approach to um, accessing this information. So I will go to the dashboard must have a broken link there, but I do have it open here. Um, this is it here. Again, it's got a look and feel similar to a lot of our other dashboards. It's meant to sort of start general and then do these more deeper dives to um, specific locations or attributes of the data, depending on how deep you want to go. 
Um, but we have this landing page. We have a nice picture of Gary here going out and getting this data for me, which is which is great. Um, overall summary of what the the different tabs are trying to do. Links to the TBEB tools are packaged if you want to go that route. Um, and then um, yeah, so I'll just show you the the summaries pages again. You know, this is sort of the overall uh, picture of what's going on with these transects. Um, this is our our summary of the frequency occurrence estimates from the beginning of time when we had these data to current and uh, the summaries by individual species and then a map of uh, where these data are collected. So all of this is interactive, uh, of course. You can click on points on the map, get information about what the transect name is, uh, where the starting point is, which who's the responsible monitoring agency, yada, yada. Um, and then what's kind of fun about these summary graphics here is, you know, the, the graphics themselves are, of course, interactive. You get this functionality from using the R package, but you also have these, these nice options up top to select what information you see in these individual graphics. So we have a date slider if you want to subset by date. Uh, maybe you want to look at the whole time series, you can do it that way. Um, we have options for showing you what base segments you want to look at. So I said earlier that some of these functions will take optional arguments of which base segment you want to look at. And so this total, um, you know, this frequency occurrence summary graphic time series on, on the right here, um, the example I showed you in my slides had a summary for all the base segments, but you can essentially pick and choose which base segments you want to look at. Um, and right now we're just looking at what's going on in old Tampa Bay, or maybe we can look at what's just going on in Hillsborough Bay. So you can select and choose that as you wish to get that, that more specific segment wide information. And as we add more base segments, uh, essentially these, these frequency occurrence estimates are going to be averages across all of those base segments. Um, and you can pick and choose different species. Um, you know, just like we can from the graph, but you can do it up here as well. I'll throw in Calerpa as an example. Um, this is something that uh, is an emerging uh, uh, species that we've seen cropping up in places where um, sometimes these submerged vegetation is being replaced by Calerpa, and we have seen an uptick in the frequency occurrence of Calerpa as well. It's just uh, something that, that has we've noticed uh, through our data in the last couple of years that that is something that it might be worth investigating to understand the mechanisms behind that. So we put in Calerpa as an option. Um, and again, this is the overall summary, but maybe we wanna look at individual transects. Um, here I have the, uh, the S1 T16 transect there. Um, again, you can zoom on the graphics as you wish. You can add species, remove species, see how that changes, um, select the different, you know, the length of the time series you want to look at. It's all there. Um, and I also should mention you can download all of these plots with, with these, uh, uh, this camera icon up here where it will download a graphic for you if you want this as a PNG file on your own computer. Uh, and then you have access to all the other transects. And actually, I'm going to pull up um, the feather sound transect, which is a pretty interesting one. Uh, if you look at changes over time, um, we'll put the whole time series back in there. So what's interesting about this one is you see, um, I want to show this one because in the last couple of years on this transect, we see this increase in Calerpa kind of um, taking the place of, of seagrass. And um, that is something that's been observed at other locations. And as I just said, might be something worth investigating as to why that's happening. And also what is the potential environmental value of Calerpa uh, as a potential um, replacement for seagrass is their value of that species uh, being there. Um, you know, what, what are the implications of that moving forward? So I'm um, just showing you that for um, that transect. Um, and so again, this is this is your, your web page here for looking at the transect level information. 
We have some other tabs here. This is uh, my attempt at sort of evaluating changes in the seagrass edge uh, from the data. Um, this is kind of an experimental tab. I don't want to go into too much behind this, but obviously there's value in looking at changes and, and how deep that point is over time uh, because that's going to be a function of water clarity and that might be a, a nice sort of early warning indicator of changes at individual transects and so I, I attempted to sort of provide some functionality here to look at that I don't know if it's useful at this point I'm open to feedback on how this could be improved um, but uh, that's there for, for you to view and then finally uh, a data download page here where Again, this is all information you can get from the R package, but if you want to download it here, you can do that as well. Um, so you can have um, the entire data set here just by clicking this button uh, where you have the data separated down to individual quadrats, or you can have data summarized by transect and date. So this is going to be your sort of um, frequency occurrence estimates, uh, or you can look at um, actual transect locations if you want uh, sort of a uh, lat long data set here and then of course the metadata describing what's in these data sets uh, if you download them so um, that's the dashboard um, again this is a new product I'm open to the feedback on on uh, whether or not you think this is useful but feel free to look at that and, and access that information there um, I just want to quickly just talk about some of the um, trends that we're seeing, I, I, I mentioned them throughout, but again, it's worth sort of revisiting this to sort of understand what are the trends we're seeing in the transect data and what that means overall uh, for, for how we proceed with, with management in Tampa Bay. Uh, again, we did see this reduction from 2019 to 2020 across the board in all the frequency occurrence estimates. Um, we don't necessarily think this is something that's isolated to Tampa Bay uh, in terms of Southwest Florida in general, I think maybe this might be a regional phenomenon, but uh, once we get the, uh, the coverage maps, we'll be able to better assess these changes at that acreage scale. Um, and then we did see some, in some places, uh, more increases in cholerica than we've seen in the past, and we don't necessarily know exactly what that means. And that might be an area of, of research focus moving forward that we could think about. And as I said before, we'll ultimately, ultimately want to link this information back to the uh, coverage maps as they uh, become available. Um, and I want to put in the teaser here, I am also working on a coverage dashboard um, that when we do have um, the 2020 maps available to us, I'll probably spend some more time making this a more um, accessible dashboard. Right now it's a little bit buggy, but my hope is that not only can you just sort of look at the data um, at, at the segment or baywide level, but my hope is that you can maybe draw these sort of custom polygons or areas of interest and get a sense of how uh, the coverage has changed during different you know, uh, pairs of years or from the last year to the current year, that sort of thing. And so again, this is my attempt at opening that information. So I look forward to that. And then, um, yeah, so that's that's really all I wanted to show you today. Um, just kind of a general overview of these products. I get the data and then just sort of uh, getting a sense of what some of these these trends are looking like just in the transit data with the anticipation that when we get the coverage maps available to us, we'll be able to more sort of quantitatively look at those those coverage changes. Those are some links and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions about this uh, if there's time. There's time. You're getting lots of accolades in the chat. People like the color gradient scheme. Um, Emma's also interested and curious about the switch to Calerpa. Um, she's noting that it could make an interesting study. Um, yeah, we've thought about maybe potentially partnering with um, some of the local universities to start to try and answer some of those questions. Does anybody have any specific uh, questions for Marcus? I'm not seeing or hearing anything, but I think people are really appreciative of having these resources available to them. So if y'all want to chime in, that's fine. I do have a number of announcements I'd like to get through, so don't sign off early if you can help it. Uh, as Marcus, uh, you know, is setting you up for, we know that the biennial 
seagrass mapping results are coming. That um, Southwest Florida Seagrass Working Group is scheduled for April 16th, and so then you'll get to see the the results um, throughout the the whole district coast. Um, so keep stay tuned for those results. Um, since our last TAC meeting, you might have also um, seen that the water quality results for 2020 that scorecard was finalized. Um, so we just wanna share with you all um, from the decision matrix perspective that the estuary program manages from, this was the sixth straight year that we have Old Tampa Bay in that cautionary alert um, phase. So um, that's that's something to keep in mind um, that it's maybe a little bit different of a story than, than what we've told in the past, um, that we're continuing to see those um, pyridinium blooms in the summer month that are um, causing challenges for managers. And so um, we need to continue to work to reduce nutrients from all sources and uh, better understand the factors that are driving uh, pyridinium blooms in particular in that bay segment. Um, I also wanted to let you all know that the Southwest Florida Water Management District is um, just kicking off an effort to update the Tampa Bay swim plan. It's been a little more than 20 years since the last time they updated that plan. Um, and I believe several of you uh, may be tapped to participate in a stakeholder working group to help um, update that plan. And Doug Robeson is on this call, I think. And um, you know he can he can weigh in on some of that but i think he's helping the district um, with that effort um, along those lines believe it or not it's uh it's coming up on five years since we updated the ccmp um, and so that means it's time to to just do a little temperature check um, interim update assessment um, and so at the next TAC meeting, I think um, I'd like to come to you all um, with a discussion about the research priorities that are included in the CCMP and get you all thinking about um, potential updates to that research agenda that we have. Um, as I hope you um, are noticing, I work pretty, I, I, treat, I treat the CCMP pretty seriously and I use it as, you know, the plan that I'm working from. And so it's guiding what goes into the TBRF calls, um, what topics I try and bring um, here to the to the technical advisory committee, um, and those research priorities are ones that you know we really do try and work in um, to the the funding streams that we have available to to really try and answer those questions. And so, there's a number of uh, projects that we've that we've worked on um, throughout with partners in the region. Um, made some progress so i think it's a good a good time to revisit that and if there are research questions that you all have that you think would help protect and restore and improve the management of tampa bay um, that's kind of where i'd like to kick that process off um, i also want to make sure that you all are aware that the southwest florida neps um, and others are hosting a um, three-part workshop on macroalgae that's on March 29th, the 31st, and April 2nd. Um, it's going to address some of these issues that we're seeing um, in other estuaries, particularly to the south of ours, um, and some of these sort of emerging issues uh, that, that uh, we've started to discuss here today. And then I also wanted to make sure that you all are aware that the, the state of Florida has been working through those um, early, they were like the landscape conservation cooperatives. Um, and through that effort, they have um, been working to develop these ecological report cards. Um, and so there's gonna be two webinars. It'll be a, a repeat of the same one. So pick the date that works for you, but those report cards um, will be rolled out on March 30th and 31st. And so that might be interesting um, for many of you on the call today. Those are my announcements. Um, is there anybody else that has anything um, that they'd like to share for the group or any other announcements to make? Hey, Maya, um, I just uh, got a, I mean, others may be aware of it, but I was just notified today that um, the Patel Center is is going to be having a virtual uh, conference April 8th and 9th, um, it's a sustainability and resiliency. So I can forward that to you uh, yeah. to share out if you'd like.
Anybody else have anything to share? Sheila? Hey, Maya. Um, just real quick, I know some of you guys come out to some of our give a day events. So thank you for all the TAC members that come out and participate in volunteer events. Um, we do have two coming up. The first is on May 1st, um, and that's at the um, Salt Creek. We'll be meeting at Bartlett Park. Um, so pretty close in downtown St. Pete. So if y'all are interested. Um, and then we also have one on May 22nd that's out at beautiful Fort DeSoto. And if you volunteer, you actually get a free day out onto um, the island. So that's a great opportunity to give back and get a free day at the beach. So um, if I can drop the link for those of you who are interested. Thanks, Sheila. Anybody else? All right. <laughs> well, nobody, nobody, nothing. 63 people, nothing to announce. Your world's boring. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I don't have an announcement, but I guess I'll ask you all a question. Um, I am new to St. Pete and stuff, and I've started seeing the like public hearings for the Tropicana field reinvigoration or whatever. And a few of the plans have this giant like greenway and stream restoration and stuff right through the middle of it. So I'm just curious if um, this group or other folks have kind of been involved in any of those conversations because it looks like there's a big green component of it. And especially after hearing that stream restoration presentation, which was great. I'm just wondering um, if we've been involved with any of that. Um, we typically let uh, those discussions about specific projects get go through the agency on Bay Management. That's um, more of what what that group deals with and there there is some overlap with the technical advisory committee and then just the city of st petersburg is a member government of the estuary program um and so to the extent that uh you know they look they look for for our feedback or are implementing the ccmp um that we work with them in that way but i i agree with you that it'd be a really great topic for the agency on bay management to um to learn more about we can share that with Alana as well. Well, thanks. And welcome to the area. Thank you. Now, Tiffany, you have funding opportunities that come up um, pretty regularly. Yeah, so annually, um, I just submitted some, a few for January that I just got to the area for, but usually, um, yeah, I submit funding proposals in January. They're pretty small scale, um, but any sort of coastal restoration projects um, with a focus on benefiting a threatened and endangered species, um, I can work on. But like I said, it is kind of sm small funding, um, usually 10 to 70,000. So depending on the scale of the projects, but I definitely have um, financial opportunities if anyone wants to reach out with some potential projects in the area. Awesome. Thanks. And you can always share those opportunities with me too, and I'll make sure that it gets out in the tack glass. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, do you want to unmute and talk about the, the guidance that DEP has put out for SAV monitoring? I know I shared that internally and I have it to share with the TAC as well. She might not be able to, but just for you all, um, for your benefit, uh, the FDEP has put out some new guidance for um, submerged aquatic vegetation monitoring, um, and it's available online, and I'll include it in a future TAC blast. The link is also in the chat. Jennifer shared it. I purposely timed this one, guys, so you'd have time to talk. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, I guess I can share briefly um, that the Southwest Florida Regional Ambient Monitoring Program, uh, we've, we've postponed sampling and split sampling comparison, but we are coordinating with Hillsborough County who generally coordinates the split sample for our group. And we're hoping to have that coordinated to have a drive-through social or physical distance collection upcoming in April, uh, Wednesday the 14th. So please keep in tune to the TVAP website who hosts our um, proceedings and meeting updates and hopefully we'll be able to see some people out there for those split samples. Thanks. Awesome, thanks Natasha. Hey, this is Brian at USF. I, I, I don't know if this is the right form. You can tell me if it's not, but um, I'm working with Steven Fernandez, who does a lot of LIDAR and drone photography and GIS work. And um, last, I think is October, he did um, a study of shore acres and found that basically everything level two and below was inundated with sunny day flooding, tidal flooding. And so, we're kind of interested in applying his research um, from a technical standpoint and then from an urban design and kind of future forecasting standpoint into engaging the community and thinking about what that area needs to do going forward. And then also we can do LIDAR studies and find other areas which we found in Tampa that are two and below. And then thinking about sea level rise going forward for the next say 10, 15 years, like things that are places that are 2.5 and below. Um, so anyway, these are this is like interest area and Shore Acres being one of them. And then um, Port Tampa City or Old Port Tampa, another one. And um, and then there's some interest like from the Army Corps to, to have like a test case kind of location for places that are already experiencing sunny day flooding. So I'm just sort of throwing that out there to see if there's any interest or anyone wants to pursue that with us or write contacts. Yes, hello, good morning, how y'all doing? Still morning, right? <laughs> the, the, this is the Asher Gonzalez from the Planning Commission. Uh, um, a couple of things that I'd like to bring up. The first one would be um, that there was discussion that may be of interest to this body in terms of like the new, uh, high hazard coastal uh, area map is going to be released by the department of emergency emergency management uh, there's no set date line between, but it should be between now and june and you know the the date of the release will be the date that the marshal you know the state fire marshal you know emails that out so <laughs> that will be the the date of the release so anyhow but there will be uh some obviously that will involve a lot of activities in terms of like you know, analysis of what it, what will the impact be. There's already been some analysis from our our our, and our agency in terms of what that represents, but we will need to wait for the publication in order to actually, you know, talk about, uh, uh, you know, final things. The other, uh, I think, yeah. Oh, and the other thing, there was a, there was a very interesting presentation to the, river, the Hills Board of Riverboard related to the Tampa Pure project. Remember, this is the project where we do, uh, the, the city of Tampa is looking at recycling water from, you know, wastewater to portable water. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of discussions as to that. Uh, um, what came out of the presentation, the people that attended, they were saying that there's a lot of questions still about this project, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, including within the city uh, management structure, you know, uh, the city utilities and things like that. So, so there's still a lot, a lot of uh, distance to go on this, uh, but it is something that the the leadership in the city is pushing forward. So, it's something to bring you bring you up to speed there. Uh, that's about it. Any questions on that? Thanks, yeah, sir. All right. If there's no more announcements. Our next meeting is scheduled for June 23rd. We're still thinking it's going to be virtual, but we're hopeful that everybody's the vaccines are making their way through the age groups and that we'll be ready to be in person in October for basis seven. 
along with our uh, colleagues from all the other national estuary programs throughout the country. So um, I can't wait to, to meet everybody back in real life again in October, but keep that um, June 23rd date on your calendar. I got my shot yesterday. Yeah. My arm was just a little sore. Actually, the flu shot hurt more. So, <laughs> so get your vaccines. Get your vaccines. Send me any meeting topics that you would like to see on the agendas. Otherwise, it's just whatever wild hairs I come up with. So, <laughs> and thank you, everybody. I'm not sure if Aaron joined us, but um, if you did, I missed you, buddy. <laughs> So I look forward to seeing everybody next meeting. Thanks.